Hello, Paul. Great to see you. I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. So you've worked as an activist for global action on sustainability for many years and in many different guises, including those you've been a campaigner, an entrepreneur, you're an advisor to the CEOs of major corporates, you're an author, you've been an educator, and one of the many hats that you wear that's relevant to this conversation is that of a fellow of CISL, the Institute for Sustainability Leadership here at Cambridge. The basis for this conversation is that you've produced a short and powerful paper on the Great Disruption, and you've clearly been vocal about this looming Great Disruption for many years. And I'm interested to know whether your views have evolved over that time, or has the evidence base just strengthened and, and your predictions come to pass? The uh, capacity of the market to respond and become self-reinforcing uh, has, has been stronger than I would have expected. I've always argued the market was how we deliver change, but once it gets moving, it really has its own power and its own momentum, I think, has become a lot more clear. So in spite of some of those market dynamic shifts, not everyone shares your judgment that climate change is such a significant, systemic and urgent issue. And I'm really interested to know why you think that is. There is no question the inherent nature of vested interest to protect itself um, means that they've been actively resisting change and slowing down change. But, but I'd say actually also one of the things is we don't think as systems thinkers. In business, you're rewarded for narrow thinking. And that's not how the system works. To truly understand the existential economic risks that we face in this area, you have to think systemically. Some of the pushback that we encounter about whether climate change is even an issue and sometimes the, the response we get is, yes, it's an issue. It's just not the biggest issue. There are more pressing yeah. issues, which might be about um, politics or cost of living. How do you situate mm. climate change in relation to that? So I think it's not just the most important issue. It is sort of the underpinning issue of, of, our, of our society and our economy. It is representative of these much broader issues, a set of issues, you know, around sustainability, biodiversity loss, you know, the instability of our oceans, our water supply, et cetera, these are all interconnected. So it's not an issue we can avoid. You know, most of the big questions in society, alleviation of poverty, inequality, whatever, you know, you want to pick, it's like, you know, the world would be better if we dealt with them, right? Whereas uh, climate change is not like the world would be better if we dealt with it. It doesn't get a little bit unpleasant. It gets catastrophic and existential very quickly. And that's a different nature, the different nature of this issue versus all the other issues you refer to. We're often encountering, I suppose, a worldview that our goal is to optimise for economic performance when everything else is just seen as, a, I suppose, a risk or enabler of that to be managed in support of economic um, performance. I'm interested in how you navigate that when you're engaging people at senior levels. That's really the nature of my, of my new paper, is to say, look, this is not another ecological issue. Uh, this is actually going to prevent us from managing the economy. It's going to prevent us from having a stable geopolitical context in which to operate. It's going to, it's going to have a huge influence in terms of conflict and security. Right? And, so, and people tend to think, okay, well, climate change, okay, costs will go up, disasters will get worse, insurance will be a bit more expensive, it'll have an inflationary impact, but we, we normally accommodate those changes. And that's, that's missing the idea that sustainability and climate change underpins our economy. If your objective is to optimise for efficiency or optimise for economic outcome, you really better pay a lot of attention to fixing climate change. Um, otherwise, you won't have any capacity to do the rest of what you do. You lay out quite a bleak picture in your paper, but in spite of that, you're very clear that you believe that we can choose to turn this around. And you talk about that being a choice. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in practical terms, who do you think needs to make that choice and how might that choice be taken? How might that be catalyzed? We kind of want the big heroic figure to emerge, the Mandela, the whatever that, that we think is going to fix it all. The reality is that there's millions of steps and decisions being made by individuals who some of them might be running gigantic corporations, some of them might be taking a consumer decision, whatever, but that process starts to become self-reinforcing and, and, and starts to accelerate, it means that everything we personally do really does count. Because we work in a global interconnected system, it's also every CEO, every executive, every employee of a company who's making decisions has that framing change. But we need to get to a critical mass of those decisions 
um, before we start to see the, that translate. Okay, great. So it's not a single powerful individual deciding on behalf of us all. It's it's a movement, it's momentum, it's critical mass. Uh, one of the challenges, legitimate challenges, is the sense of, you know, every little bit counts, everybody doing some things is pushing some of the responsibility to consumers, citizens away from some of those vested interests that you noted earlier. Is there a risk that we dissipate and shift the locus of where action needs to happen by having that narrative of every little helps and everyone needs to lean in? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a really, it's a, it's a complicated uh, balance between recognising that individual action does matter and what people do personally does count, but not to fall for the trap, which you allude to, that this is a consumer's problem. Don't blame me, I just sell the oil. It's not my fault if I use it. And I've, I've had that conversation in giant corp global companies, not the oil industry, but other industries, who refer to this as being, well, it's hardly my fault if I use my product. Surely I'm not responsible for the use of my product. It's the consumer's choice and they're using it. So that that kind of idea is really, it's a bit cancerous um, as an idea. And we have to recognise that this does require policy, right? It does require heavy intervention by government at this late stage. And it does require corporate responses. Now, the consumer behaviour matters because it gives confidence to those corporate decision makers to make tougher, bolder decisions. So it's not irrelevant, but never believe that the consumer decision making is going to lead to change in this area. It just helps to grease the wheels a bit. So I want to come uh, to focus a little more on corporate responses to this. And over recent years, we've seen a huge boom in, in ESG um, mm -hmm. activity and a whole flurry of climate and sustainability commitments. Um, by most multinational corporations. I'm interested in whether you see those movements, the growth of ESG, that target setting, um, as important steps in the right direction, or is that you know, simply inadequate, or worse still, is it actually a protection of business as usual? I think the practicality of what most companies are doing is completely inadequate to the task at hand. However, I also understand that that's a process of the market and companies getting comfortable, right, that, that we are moving in the direction together. It's very, very hard for uh, for large companies to act in isolation from the market and their competitors, right? So they need to leave, but not too far, right? So that, that critical mass question also applies inside the corporate sector. That, of course, also becomes an excuse not to act. But I think the fundamental issue is that we need a lot bolder action by companies um, and it needs to be on the market and what they're doing in a practical sense, not in social responsibility reporting, et cetera. It's got to really be grounded in the, in the, in the essence of the business. So in your paper, you indicate that we've got everything that we need to turn this around. But when we're thinking specifically about action, leadership by business and financial institutions, what do you think we need more or less of? Yeah, look, I think one of the the great things we need to let go of is this sort of idea that the um, incumbent old companies are going to be part of the solution. Incumbents tend to fail and be replaced rather than transform when we go through a radical disruptive transformation. Right, I think there's there's a lot of players in this space who have become very sophisticated um, in their advocacy in the area to look as though they're acting towards you know, towards change, we're part of the solution. You know, the oil and gas industry, I think, is a good example of this, that you can't do this without us, right? And you need us to find the solutions. And there is no evidence that that's true, right? They're, 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 it's, we've been hoodwinked, including myself, have been hoodwinked for decades uh, in the belief that these companies are really an important part of the solution. I just don't think they are. We've enabled that behaviour, if you like, by letting them become partners who aren't really acting with good intentions. It's the market ana analyst in me that says disruptive innovation, disruptive transformation of markets <clears throat> tends to involve new companies being built and replacing old companies who are then destroyed, right? And, and, and destroyed through market forces, not through some activist act or through policy, but just by missing the change that's coming. Oil and gas companies, for example, won't become energy companies. They'll be replaced. And the answer for that, a reason for that is, that is that the new energy system is a different technology. <clears throat> and a different technology means a different business ecosystem. 
right? And they don't have the culture, the business skills, the people who can deliver that. The, you know, the Teslas are still a prime example of it. The Tesla brought the electric car to market, not Ford, not GM, not Toyota. You know, or they're all scrambling now to catch up. And that's when we go from an internal combustion engine car to an electric car. So if you're going from large centralised power stations, right, to software-driven solar on rooftops that are using cars as storage devices to power your house, whatever, that's such a different system. The connections there just don't make sense, you know, for today's incumbent. The most important thing we can do today is to recognise that we need radically new companies doing radically different things, whether they're incumbents or not, you know, and that is what's going to change and drive the change fast enough. So on that point, we know that there's still a lot of capital moving into carbon intensive activity in spite of the market dynamics that you've outlined. Where would you intervene then? Where would you be advocating for a focus for change within the system? Yeah, so I think this is something I've observed just in the last five years or so really strongly, is that the solution providers are so busy growing, surviving, getting capital, etc. They haven't got the, the time or the capacity or sophistication to be very effective at advocating for change amongst policymakers, amongst the public and so on. The incumbents have got decades of experience in highly sophisticated PR and policy influence machines to resist change, right? So I think that's a really kind of interesting insight is that we, you know, we have to put a lot more, have to see a lot more energy being put into arguing for change, ironically, by those who are going to benefit from it commercially, right? So you need to have electric car companies being as good at lobbying for change as the oil and gas companies are lobbying against change, right? But they're actually just busy surviving most of the time to be able to do that, right? Likewise, solar, solar companies and so on. So that's a really important idea because governments, governments don't act more strongly in this area, I think, because they don't believe it's good for the economy to take action. They still have caught up in this sort of almost 80s and 90s mindset that ecological solutions are expensive, slower, don't work as well, you know, will slow the economy down. And all the evidence is that's not true. All the evidence is the opposite. Climate change is going to be incredibly expensive. And if we don't act on it, or if we don't act on it now, we are going to face catastrophic changes. Um, and if we don't act on it for a while, we're going to face existential changes. We need people to give comfort to government. We want radical disruptive policy and we can now deliver that change as the companies right if you put those policies in place your paper has a really strong focus on technology yeah. and what tech can enable mm. i'm interested to know if there are mm. other specific changes or revolutions other than a tech revolution that you think are going to be needed in order to achieve the scale of change we need in reality if we're going to fix climate change and other issues in sustainability we're going to deliver it through the system Right, and we can deliver it through today's kind of companies invested in by you know today's kind of investors, you know, with policy made by today's kind of governments. So this idea that we're gonna we're gonna overhaul capitalism before we get there, I think, is wrong. So we have to work within that system, but that system is actually very very well primed for this approach. But it's a bit simplistic to see it, and I fall for this myself to argue it's a technology revolution. It's technology enabled, but it's socially enormously significant in terms of its ability of empowering people. So we're going to see a lot of very positive social change, I think, resulting from this technology. And that also becomes self-reinforcing. So if you get, if you're a country importing large amounts of fossil fuels, for example, and you can produce the energy yourself with new technologies using local resources, <clears throat> that radically changes your balance of payments. That radically alters the structure of your economy. Great work done by another um, CISL alumni uh, with Rethink X, right? Doing work on the food sector um, and saying, look, we've got so much potential here for radically disruptive technology in food production. If you can produce food more cheaply and more safely in country rather than relying on imports, right? That has a huge uh, geopolitical security implication, as well as a balance of payments type benefit, as well as a social stability, 
um, we, we tend to think too narrowly and not see the great sort of social benefits that will flow on from them as well. So there, I've got two reflections and one of the challenges or critiques of the current capitalist model as it's uh, as we see in, in many particularly Western economies is um, that power is being um, and capital being concentrated in the hands of a few. It's a great machine to you know deliver things efficiently, but it is leading to very unjust outcomes for society. Yeah. And the other is um, there's a perception that if one is pro action on climate change, one is anti capitalism, and that can be a barrier to engagement and communication. And I'm interested in reactions to both of those points or challenges. Yeah, they're kind of they're kind of related related issues in a way because the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. So if you go to inequality, you now capitalism will naturally you know, drive inequality. That's what Piketty and other people have done in research and said, unless you have heavy government policy or war, right, they're the two big impacts that start to slow down the natural tendency of capitalism to drive inequality. Now, the problem with that is it's not just a moral question because inequality drives instability. Inequality drives, you know, a frustration and anger in society which extremists can then build upon. I think any reasonable capitalist pro-market person, you know, is going to look at this and say, no, this is, I'm defending capitalism. I'm defending the market. I'm defending my ability to operate and for the market to be free if I support action on inequality and climate change. And, and what we're going to see otherwise is the opposite. Otherwise, you know, if you get climate change getting out of control, you you need big government and heavy intervention and high taxes to address it, right? And the longer we leave it, the worse that gets. So I think that argument's made in the 70s and 80s that it's jobs versus environment, right? And that was a fatal mistake of the advocacy in this area to fall for that trick because the reality is it's, it's protect the environment or we're going to lose a lot of jobs. So coming then to specific technologies, without situating you as a good guy or a bad guy, what are the technologies that you think that where, where the most promise resides, where you think will lead to the biggest step change um, if we can find ways to catalyze, advocate for, give space for those technologies? Where would you be focusing? You don't need, you don't need, need radical policy to make it happen anymore on energy. I think the number one opportunity in, and, and, and the number one risk in our space now is actually food, right? If we if we don't have a stable food supply, the implications will be war, you know, the conflict, hundreds of millions, if not billions of refugees. So I think we need to really put a lot of energy and focus <clears throat> on how do we address food, food production, both as a, a source of emissions, but also as a victim of emissions. And the paper that I published with um, Pablo Salas at uh, with with you at CISL methane markets and, and, and methane and markets was all about that idea that you know, methane is a hugely important question, but food and agriculture <clears throat> has the opportunity for radically disruptive change. And by the way, it would be a much better, more stable food system if, if we pursued that. So we're having this conversation in the run up to COP28, international climate negotiation. What do you see as the role of role of international climate negotiations? What's the role of COPs? Do they even have a role? I'm really torn on this one, actually. I mean, if you wanted to avoid global action on climate change, seeking a global treaty by consensus for a radical restructuring of the economy was the most effective way of delaying change that we could think of. All right, so that's sort of my, my negative view of that is that we've all been kind of conned into the idea, uh, underpinned by acting as a cost, that we must all act together without any competitive disadvantage and, and, and agree to that by consensus. It was never going to happen. Right? So that, in that sense, the cops have failed dismally. On the other hand, my argument is that real action only comes from individuals taking action within their world, whether it's in their company, their NGO, their policy area, whatever. And in that sense, COPs have become this gigantic festival of climate change action, right? Drawing connections, drawing people in, spreading ideas, taking the temperature globally as to what's going to happen. And so that symbolism, connectivity, networking that these events generate, I think actually can, can have a really powerful global impact. 
Thank you. And I suppose then uh, elevating this even more to a global context, we recognize that over the last decade, we've seen really shifting geopolitics, shifting power dynamics. We've seen a shift in power from north to south, from west to east. We've also seen that, as you outlined in your paper, the issues around climate and resources and energy become more significant for national security, government's ability mm. to provide the needs mm. of people. These issues are not just the domain of, of scientists, but have become really core to foreign policies, to trade negotiation. So I'm interested in what that means for our collective ability to, to make the choice that you say and to turn things around, given that it is now much more politicised. No, we are in a very messy period. However, we still make some really profound, um, I think, incorrect assumptions based on how we saw things 20 years ago. If you take the Rethink X view I referred to earlier and, and their work on, on, on agriculture, energy and, 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 and technology across the board, their argument is that poor countries could actually benefit the most from the change, right? And But we're living in a world where the rich caused it the rich won't suffer, the poor will suffer, the rich should pay for it. Now, I think the rich should pay for it because they actually did cause it, so that's right. But that that's predicated on the idea that the that it's expensive to fix, that it's negative for your economy to fix, right? Whereas the evidence is not, that's not true, right? And and that actual, an actual fact, renewable clean energy, for example, is going to be cheaper, easier and safer to do than the alternatives. So I think that that will eventually change the politics. But I think as we as we recognise that the countries that are most advanced in this area are actually the most economically economically successful, you know, we've seen this recently with with China really growing dramatically in terms of electric car production and exports, right? And Europe and the US kind of going into panic mode about losing market share. Um, to Chinese electric car manufacturers. It's economically beneficial to lead. And I think populism being driven on the back of opposing climate action is a losing game for the populists, that the evidence eventually will, over, will overwhelm them in that sense. So I want to end by going from that global <laughs> down to the individual, as you know, CISL, the Institute for Sustainability Leadership, we have nearly 40,000 individuals across our international network, people who've engaged with our leaders group, who've been through our education programs, who've engaged with us in some way, most of them pretty senior within business, within finance, within um, government institutions. I'm interested in what you think they should be doing in practical terms to contribute to that choice, to that movement that you talked about, that critical mass. What mm. should they be doing? Well, I think, I really think that it's a very powerful network, first of all. Well, I think it, it really is uh, quite extraordinary how much diffuse influence the CISL network can have. And I think one of the most critical ones is is this idea of moving, you know, the narrative from pain to gain. We have this narrative of pain. Acting is expensive. Acting is difficult. Acting costs the economy. Acting will be, you know, be bad for our growth. Clearly not true in terms of the evidence. So as opposed to the argu making the argument that this is about responsibility, the right thing to do, critical for our future, et cetera. No, this is actually, it is all those things, but it's actually also about opportunity for growth, economic benefit, or competitiveness against other companies, et cetera. I think it starts to reframe that idea, you know, and that language getting through the business community, I think is also, also really crucial. Um, and I also think we need to change this idea that the the the, the laggards, you know, are, are are going to hold us back. The laggards are going to lose, right? And that idea that the laggards are somehow a problem, um, I think we should you know, argue, if you like, a, a strategy of inevitability. We are going to change, right? And we're going to change dramatically. And large companies are going to be very successful who get this right. And they're going to be hopeless failures to get it wrong, right? And that again, that mindset shift by all the you know the forty thousand whatever it is CISL you know influenced alumni etc. Now that's really powerful. That's a really powerful group out there in society to start to change the way we think about um, these issues and the way we talk about them. 
Thank you. So I heard a big focus on narrative shifts there, on mindset shifts and, and harnessing the, the power of that network effect. Just getting people together can catalyze new ideas, new collaborations and so on within the network. So thank you very much for your time today. A lot of um, great, challenging, provocative uh, inputs there. Anything else that you'd like to share before we wrap this up? I think the only other thing which I really emphasise in the paper, um, which I'd encourage people to really internalise, is that we're really accelerating now on every front. The climate change is accelerating, but also the market's response is accelerating. It's going to be chaotic. It's going to be messy, right? And it's going to be quick. And so the ability to be agile and respond and move quickly and not be overwhelmed or demoralised by it you know, is, I think, really, really important to actually make that change happen um, as quickly as we possibly can. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you.